This is an excerpt from my novel, Imago. These are the first, can you hear me in the back? These are the first pages of my novel, Imago. Ray opens his hand and lets the empty bottle roll across his fingertips to the floor. He is on his back on the couch and unbuckles his belt with one hand and paws the gully between the couch and coffee table with the other, feeling for his cigarettes. Everything has made it into this gap. The phone, his smokes, lighter, all within lazy reach. Only the big glass ashtray, stubbled with a day's worth of butts and ringed with ashes, is still on the table. Ray picks the last cigarette from its soft pack and pushes it between his lips. He crumples the empty, pa em he crumples the empty pack, drops it, and feels for his lighter. Ray gets drunk every night on the cheap vodka I pick up for him at Vaughn's. It used to be absolute and kettle one, but now it's quantity. 1.5 liter bottles of pop-off or smeared off or whatever else is on sale in the big plastic jugs with hand holes shaped into them. I watch Ray with his cigarette and am almost envious of his pleasure, this smoky dessert after a liquid meal. In the beginning, with the novelty of our relationship as incentive, I drank with him, but not so much anymore. Now I observe. Ray takes long drags, flicks ashes in the direction of the ashtray, and when he's finished with it, mashes his cigarette out on an edge of ashtray and pushes it in among the others. A thin string of smoke still rises as it unfurls and slips over onto the table. Ray doesn't notice as he unzips his fly and begins to massage inside his pants. He is proud of his erections, especially when he's drunk. Look, it's all rubbery, he says to me, working his hand up and down himself. He wags his cock at me. Babe, look. <laughs> I'm sitting at the desk and clasp my hands behind my back, stretching my shoulders, and slump again. It's late and I'm tired from work. I'm glad I have tomorrow off, not least because Ray has practice and I'll get the place to myself. <coughs> Ray is more, more than 20 years older than I am and not someone I'll bring home soon or ever. My mother met him once when she was visiting me in Washington and we all went to dinner. She thought he was handsome. But he smokes, she had said, and of course something about his age. My father only knows of Ray, though not from my mother. They haven't spoken in years. I've met Ray's parents, though, who like me because, as his mother says, I'm a good influence on her son. It's a very motherly and stupid thing to say. It's not hard to be a good influence on a manic depressive alcoholic when you yourself are neither. His mother had given him the ashtray. Ray and I have been together almost three years, and in the absolute days, before I moved in, he'd warned me not to get involved with him, that he was bad news and dangerous for a nice girl like me. But for a nice girl like me, words like that are kindling. And so I buy Ray vodka so he'll love me more. I supply his three-pack-a-day cigarette habit, and he tells me I'm such a good girl. No one has ever been so good to him, he says and I carefully tend our garden-style, one-bedroom-sized life in the valley and feel accomplished. I also know that as long as I stubbornly, pre stubbornly preoccupy myself with Ray, with his overwhelming needs and demands, I can almost disabuse myself of the idea that I'm in denial. Whatever. Look at your old man, Ray says from the couch, grinning. I made it just for you. <laughs> He makes me laugh and I hike my skirt up and go over to him. I don't bother to undress, just push my panties to the side and straddle him, one foot sinking into the couch, the other on the floor. He holds my bottom, my perfect ass, cupped in his big nicotine-stained hands and moves me onto him. Even drunk, there is a deliberateness, deliberateness to raise lovemaking, a slow certainty I attribute to older men and it draws me in spite of myself. Such a good, good girl, he says, and I glow. 
Ray's hands are around my waist and he's guiding me on and off him when the phone rings at my foot and startles me and I come down squarely on top of him. Oof! He lets out a smoky breath. It rings again and I lean over to check the caller ID. I feel my face flush. I try to steady my breathing. It rings again and I know I ought to pick up, but don't. Part of me wants to keep fucking and I rise up a little. One more ring that'll go to voicemail. That's better. I close my eyes and try to ignore the phone, but all of a sudden Ray reaches for it saying, shit, I never called Al about practice tomorrow, and he thumbs it on. He almost says hello, but I'm quicker, and I snatch the phone, letting him slip out of me. My father! <laughs> I mouth. Hello? I say and sit on the edge of the couch and pull my underwear over me. I try to focus on how my thighs look, thinner this way. Annabelle? It's Holly. Oh, Holly, hi! I know I sound fake when I talk to her. I've been meaning to call, but I lie. Annabelle? Annabelle, your father had a heart attack. Oh, Annabelle, he died. It feels like someone yanked my hair, like my scalp suddenly contracted, and prickles the way it does when someone scares you from behind a door. My thumb twitches. Boop. I just hung up on my father's wife by mistake. I try to get Holly back, but it's only a dial tone. I press again. Silence. But I keep the phone to my ear for a second longer before sliding it through the ashes onto the table. Call back right now, I tell myself, but don't. I'm going to read an excerpt from the first chapter of my novel, The Trespassers. It's set in 1985, and the main character, Ali Ramzani, is an Iranian OBGYN who has become the target of late of a pro-life group called the Mission Saviors. Ali had gotten out of bed sometime around one, after the invisible hand had shaken him awake again, setting him twisting in the sheets like a kite caught in a tree. He gave up like he always did, went downstairs to wander the rooms of his house, walking a pointless little route, living room to kitchen to family room and back. He paused to touch the things he passed, look at them before putting them down, as though in the middle of the night they held a strange psychic force, clues that revealed something about his life. Three weeks of nights gone this way. He added it up in his head all this time, felt the hours still ahead of him floating in the dark outside, waiting to climb up over him like moss on an old broken building, push him down farther in his old chair, and with no fight even, just handed over with his head down. He raised himself out of his seat and walked to the kitchen, brewed a pot of tea, splashed cold water on his face at the sink. These people were not going to make him some incompetent. He'd get to work. He could be useful still. At half past four, he took his tea into the family room and put the light on. There was a four-month backlog of JAMAs and obstetrics and gynecology and New England Journal of Medicine waiting for him on the end table. He looked at the towering pile, stacked so sloppily, the corners of unopened letters sticking out jaggedly between the journals and thought this was how he could destroy himself allowing the slackness to become what his life was. No. He sat in his chair under the reading lamp, a highlighter in his right hand, and read an article in Obstetrics and Gynecology on lymphadenectomy in early stage endometrial cancer, taking each line apart and studying its contents until he felt inside it. All of the tiniest pieces clicking together, the facts lodged safely in his mind, easy for him to retrieve later when he needed them. When he was halfway done with April's edition, he marked a spot with the highlighter. The grip he had on himself tightened just a little, and already he felt better. He opened his notebook, wrote things to do at the top of the page. Write letter to mother, buy air mail envelopes, send photo of the girls, push-ups every morning, start article on uterine prolapse case, vocabulary notebook. He couldn't think of anything else to add, so he turned the page made a list of things he ought to teach Catherine before she went away to college. Constellations, cooking rice properly in both rice cooker and pot, tourniquet making, miscellaneous knots, slip knot, stopper, overhand, axle hitch. What else was there? His hand idled above the page, drawing little circles in the air with the pen as he thought. 
itching to make contact with the paper, to record something useful. The problem he saw now, draining the last of his tea, was that he'd fallen into their trap, concentrating on all the wrong things, getting himself caught up on the sheer outrageousness of their presence. This was how he'd been spending these nights, delivering rambling soliloquies that said one thing. Can you believe this? Can you believe these people? And after that had run its course, he'd start in on the next rude irritation that set every part of him spinning inside. What to even call them? Just one of the thousand and one troubles Ali had with these people. And yet somehow, this one cut at him the most. He refused to call them protesters. There was something too legitimate, too reasonable in the word, a civic respectability to it he could not abide. Pro-lifers was an absurdity. The nobility in this, the martyrdom, the lie in the word, no. Ali had settled on harassers whenever he had to refer to these people in any official capacity, but it was not how he really thought of them. The first time he had seen them, blocking the entrance to women's health, an impossible line of linked elbows and rigid smirks hands pressed in tight fists held close to their bodies, he'd known what they were. They called themselves the mission saviors. These people were menaces, not just harassers, but hafenims, the Persian more precisely cutting expression for good for nothings. The mission saviors had arrived at his clinic's door the first day of March, promptly at eight. Homemade mission savior buttons pinned on their coats, red marker posters shrieking murder in capital letters, stubborn chins held proud against the snapping wind. For the past three months, they'd been there every day, screaming at him, frightening his patients, littering the sidewalk with the unspeakable things they like to eat. And he'd let his mind malfunction like this, stopped up and sputtering because of them. he let his life malfunction, getting tangled up in each one of the specific indignities he'd suffered. It had cost him too much, goddamn hefenoons. All night long, their faces had lined up in his head, one after the next like endless cars in a terrible, crushing traffic jam. They came to him so clearly, so easily, it felt less like he was simply brooding, pressing down as if on a bruise to feel the precise ways in which he hated them, and more like they had found him once again, here in his living room, there in his bedroom, everywhere he was, in every room of his house. He'd get a hold of himself again. He could make it simple. He'd start being honest, for one thing. These mission saviors were at war, and Ali had been pretending, wasting all this time and simply hating them, staying up all night to count the ways, when he'd known what the truth was all along. They weren't going away. But not today, no more. It was the beginning of June. He'd given them three months, but now he was worrying, his brain and his heart, all parts of himself moving fast and right. They couldn't catch him. They could try and try, but he'd gotten ahead of them, and ahead of their whole operation, and from now on, he'd be himself, but better, smarter and faster, knowing everything there was to know, building arsenals inside himself so deep he could last forever. Uh, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from my novel, which is titled, She Woke Up With The Words In Her Mouth. And uh, what you need to know about the novel basically is that it uh, spans the nine years between 1988 and 1997 following a character named Malaya Clondon from the time she's a 120-pound 6-year-old to the time she's a 500-pound 15-year-old. And this section, is, it opens up the latter section of the novel. The smells of black coconut and African pear oil seeped from the tables that lined the street and wafted toward Malaya at the center of the pavement. There they met with the fried and jerk chicken, roti and rice pudding, platanos and candy yam smells that oozed from storefront restaurants. The scents mixed together like the ingredients of a gumbo, spilling over her as she walked block after endless block, veering inward to make room for a hurried dreadlock man, then outward to avoid colliding with a cluster of children, giggling in bubble jackets and hoodies. As she walked, Malaya fingered the three purple braids that hung from her left temple and made games for herself, trying not to imagine what 125th Street thought of her, this 500-pound block of black girls streaked with color, bounding toward the big and tall men's section of Harlem jeans. The melody of the girl group TLC's newest ballet drifted across 8th Avenue, and a bootlegger in the alcove between the Apollo Theater and Tzitzi's African hair braiding pumped Shabba Ranks' deepest bass line onto the street. The chords of these songs blended with the sounds of laughter, cat calls, arguments over the prices of African masks and homemade soaps. 
children snickered as Maya forced herself through the crowd, and an older homeless man shouted, whoa, when she passed him, springing his arms back and making an exaggerated leap out of her way. But through all of this, Malaya's ears were warmed, warmed by the soft foam pads of her headphones and the lyrics of the hip hop song she had discovered last year in the ninth grade and claimed as her personal anthem, the first single from her newfound idol and kindred soul. It was all a dream. I used to read Word Up magazine, salt and pepper and heavy D up in the limousine. Damn right I like the life I live cause I went from negative to positive and it's all good. The song was an irresistible tale of rags to riches, chronicling the rapper's rise from blinding despair into unfathomable technicolor hope. The artist was a bulging black man from Brooklyn with a lazy eye and a face as soft as chocolate frosting. His album was full of all the things Malaya's mother hated and many of the things her mother loved. I'm sorry, it was full of all of the things Malaya's mother hated and many of the things her father loved. Sex and death and hope and fantasy all mixed together like a fruit compote baked into a hard but secretly sweet crust. Malaya loved the paradox of the rapper's name, Biggie Smalls, how it was huge and intimidating but also diminutive, how it said so many things that she'd been feeling for those 15 years of life. The halls of Galton Prep Academy were as bland as a pot of weak old grits until the ninth grade when hip hop came and brought its butter, along with an influx of public school kids from the Bronx and Brooklyn, including Rayshawn Carter, the reason for her trip today. Rayshawn was light and tall and seemed to have pulsed on the verge of manhood since infancy. He was both down to earth and definitively fly, changed his hair to the rhythm of music video fashion and loved Biggie nearly as much as Malaya did. When her mother saw the rapper's CD titled Ready to Die in Rayshawn's bag, she arched her eyebrows and said, so this is the message our artists are sending our children now? <laughs> but her father only shook his head and said that the album reflected a new generation's struggle and that it was their job as parents not to understand. <laughs> the food smells receded and the acrid stink of new plastic bags smacked forth as Malaya pushed her way into the store. Big woman, said the cherry-colored African man at the back check counter, rounding his arms into a sumo wrestler pose. The man looked friendly enough, but he had wet, old eyes that seemed to catch on Malaya's body and drag away only full seconds after he spoke. You're big, but you have a pretty face. I'll call you big woman, pretty face, he concluded, but his eyes raked her stomach. Malaya gave a polite smile and retreated to the music, dreaming of the denim that would change her, letting the man's voice claw at her back like a curl of stale smoke. There were no mannequins in the big and tall men's section, only reams of logo stamped cloth folded two or three times back, elbows pinioned together, hems rolled three times under to gesture at a human-sized form. Malaya pushed pa past the Paco and Boss and Pele Pele racks toward the MC labels, which she'd chosen as her favorite when she, was, when she made the twin discoveries a year ago that the brand both spelled out her initials with its logo and carried clothes in her size. When she heard the way her favorite rapper used it in a chart-topping single, she considered it destiny. Throw down some ice for the nicest MC. Niggas know the C-Lo unbelievable. <laughs> Malaya scanned the racks for a purple MC sweater and a pair of size 50 jeans, imagining giddily how the cuffs of the jeans would fold into the tongues of her Timberland boots like waves of soft-served ice cream into waffle cones. How tight and slick the look would make her feel. She imagined another version of herself joining Rayshawn in a room that glinted with color and lights. The two sprawled over each other, he in his hip hop high fashion and she in hers, a perfect curve at her chest and hips, the only meaningful difference between them. As she hovered beside the banks of oversized denim, a slim saleswoman with skin the color of Ritz crackers approached. Her eyes were apple cider warm at first, but when Malaya asked for what she wanted, the woman looked at her as though she had asked for a side of creme fraiche with her McDonald's value meal. <laughs> um, they don't make big men's shirts in purple, she said, running a green acrylic tip nail over her hairline. And the biggest jeans we got is a 48. Malaya squeezed herself through the narrow dressing room door, praying for the 48s to fit. Undressing, she felt the air lit cool against the pink strip of skinless flesh that two small jeans of the past had left around her middle where a waist should have been. She pulled the 48s up, past thighs that cleaved together like colliding mudslides, past hips swaddled in sagging stomach flesh. Gulping breath, she pushed the ends of the, de the, of the denim together, willing them to meet, but they wouldn't. She tried again, six times, 
until her eyes stung and watered. Under hot skin, Malaya struggled to keep her face together, to keep her cheeks from cracking, keep her eyes from melting and gushing into the fibers of the rug. She breathed in again, now wishing to suck in her skin, her fat, her muscle, and whatever it was that lay under all of those things, making her who she was, this person in this body, wedged between the walls of the big and tall men's section, wishing at her core, at her core to feel small and slight and somehow like a girl. Thank you. And tonight I'll be reading an excerpt from a story called Crawl Space, which is in the novel I'm working on. And um, the setting is Christmas Day and the 20-something uh, first-person narrator who is visiting from uh, his home from San Francisco, where he lives now, as a, and working as like this office temp, he's uh, being uh, forced to help his father replace the insulation below the house on Christmas. Uh, my father and I move um, into the crawl space beneath the kitchen, the final area we are to re-insulate and clean. Every now and then we hear the sound of my shuffling feet above my mother's house slippers across the hardwood floor as she sets up the turkey. In front of us is a tangle of low-hanging wires and a large heating duct, which we'll be forced to clamor over hands and knees. The crawl space here is the darkest yet. Unlike the areas we'd cleaned earlier, where bits of daylight had been able to splinter in, here it is completely dark. My father shines his lantern, surveying the concrete perimeter of the room. And there's halfway fallen out sheets of insulation, which hang like great yellow webs. My father crawls to an area he est estimates to be the middle of the room, and here he fastens the lantern to an overhead pipe, and we're able to see, strewn along the ground, piles of soggy, unusable insulation, rusted metal and trash, dead roaches on their backs. My father crawls toward the largest pile and picks up an old foil-faced insulation board. With a sudden, violent motion, he snaps it in two. He curses in a mix of Mandarin and English, something in between the English word sick and the Mandarin phrase shizhen, which means dead person. He is referring to the workman he had initially hired from an ad in the local newspaper. Can't do anything right, he says, and then picks up an empty beer can and chucks it in the trash bag he's been dragging around. He curses again and then again, never seeming to realize that perhaps it was his fault to hire them in the first place, or to refuse full payment until he thought the work was satisfactory. The work never was, and our family ended up getting sued. He's quiet for a moment, resigned almost. And then he finds another large pile of trash previously hidden along the wall. Stupid dumb, he yells. I creep over to my side of the crawl space to make it seem as if I'm keeping occupied. In the farthest corner, I find some newspapers. In the pile, there seems to be something stiff. Digging around, I discover a small, half-decomposed mouse. I examine it with my wire, prodding it around a little and poke it into my trash bag. Need hand, my father calls out. Can't, I say, working. <laughs> hand, hand, he barks, hand. From across the space, I hear the sound of him taking two deep angry breaths, and I consider pulling the dead mouse out of the bag and flinging it, flinging it at him. And then the lantern goes out. I didn't do it, I say. Look, I'm not even close to it. I'm right here. Don't make me laugh, he says. Nobody's trying to, I say. For a moment, everything is dark and silent, as if we're no longer there. And then my father takes a deep and noisy breath, the kind of breath, deep breath he takes to try to calm down or begin to scream. And then it's his retirement party. In the grand reception area of a hotel 45 minutes away from our house, together with my family and a bunch of people I don't really know, we celebrate my father. Everyone there is Asian except for one white person, an engineer who had married one of the Taiwanese women and who I had once gotten into a particularly irritating political argument with. 
Towering ceilings, flutes of champagne, sunlight streaming in from the gigantic windows in the glass dome above me standing. An improvised speech, not entirely different from the wedding toast I'll give my sister and her husband a year or so later. At the end, something I've never said to my father before. <coughs> I love you, Dad. The words feel awkward and new. A couple people in the audience are crying. These are the people who will come up to me later and shake my hand and say, what a good speech, Jim. And I do not care for these people. I do not know where my mother or sister are, what they're doing. I do not really care about that either. What I want to do is watch my father's reaction. His face flushes a little. He nods. Good, he says, patting my arm once. There are times when I wake up from a dreamless night and I look out the window at the fog and hills and houses atop those hills and I wonder where the hell I am. I listen to the ocean against the cliffs and open my window and breathe in salty air. Other times while eating with my aunts or sitting on the toilet, I'm more certain. I think about events to come. I think about my future as a happy person. I think about what my wife and kids might look like. Sometimes I think about my father's inevitable death. And I'm terrified. It occurs to me that although I probably love my mother more, the person I think about more often is my father. I have not seen him in a couple years. Only a few times have we spoken during this period, and it was in grunts and obligations. And yet I still wonder what I will be thinking about when I hear the news. The last I heard from my mother was that he was okay. But what will happen when I hear that he is not? Which sad scene will I recall? And which will he? In that split second before everything stopped, could he have ever imagined I might still be trying to talk to him? Thank you.